Okay, so getting into this next set of videos, we're going to be taking a look at uh, being able to create our own custom classes in Java. So we're going to go through the idea of objects, classes, uh, in an abstract sense. We'll then also talk about actually implementing classes and going through some of the, um, uh, at least on a fundamental level, some of the best practices when trying to create your own custom classes. Um, we'll also talk a little bit about uh, whenever you make objects from these classes, how you can actually use those in your code. Okay. So to start off with, we're going to take a look at a, an abstract explanation of uh, classes and the objects that you can make from them. So uh, as of right now, what you're probably most accustomed to is just creating a single uh, Java file. So you just have your one Java file. And then inside of that Java file, you typically have a line where you'll say something like public class and then whatever the name happens to be that you gave this particular uh, file. So say maybe you created a file that you called something like um, tester. So you have your public class tester. You then create your body for it. So you have something kind of like this right here. And then later on you can also close the body of it. And then you have the entire body, and inside of that body, you might have you know, your single main method, your public static void main, your string args, and then have your opening curly brace for that. Maybe place that somewhere in there, and then close that. So this is the general structure that we see right now. You know, we have a single class, the main method. At some point you might create additional methods, you might be at least familiar enough with that at this point. But now what I want to start looking at is the ability to not only have this one single Java file with a single class that uh, contains all of the code for your program, I want to start creating multiple files. So we're going to have multiple classes and we're going to be able to use these classes together with each other. Okay, so the idea now is that we want to create a second file somewhere else in our program, and then be able to connect that to the original file with the main method inside of it. Okay, So the general idea, whenever we do this, we will create our class. So we have our public class. And for this particular one, the idea now, whenever we create one of these custom classes that we want to use with the class that holds our main method is uh, the naming convention we go with is generally it's going to describe some kind of uh, real world entity. So uh, a fairly simple example might be that we have a person class. Okay. So we would make this person class, we'd make the body for it, we would then later make a separate class. that is perhaps used to actually test out our person class. So maybe we make a class that we call something like person demo. Create that. Right here. We would then have our main method inside of it. And somewhere inside of this main method, we would start making objects out of this class. So this is the general relationship, which is that we create a class and then we create objects for that class. So uh, let's take a moment to uh, go into a little bit more detail about that relationship precisely. So the idea here is that if we have this public class person, at some point when we want to actually start using that in our code, we want to make objects out of it. So what's the relationship between this class and the objects that we're making? Well, there are a couple of different analogies you might hear. Uh, one of those is that we could describe the class itself as being kind of like the blueprints. So these are kind of like the blueprints that we use to 
later actually uh, create or construct the real objects that we're going to be using. So later on we might have our actual objects. And these are going to be things that we created from these blueprints. So the blueprints themselves are something separate from the objects that we create that are instead used to describe these individual objects that we're trying to make. So we then have our individual objects over here. Okay. Um, another analogy that we could also use if you uh, want to think about this uh, in another way is that we can also imagine that we have, say, a kind of factory of sorts. So this would be kind of like our factory. And from this factory, we are trying to build, kind of construct or manufacture the individual objects. So later on, coming out of this factory, we're going to have the individual objects that we make. So say maybe this is a factory that is used to construct, um, I don't know, say maybe we're using it to make uh, balls. So then the individual things that we make from it, say one of these is going to be a single ball that we make from it. Okay, so this is the general idea. So there are a couple of things that we want to keep in mind about uh, whenever we actually go about making one of these, so when we actually construct an object from it. So the line of code that I want to make sure that we're familiar with when we actually create an object from a class, we will specify the name of it. So in much the same way as we talk about our primitive data types, we wanna make sure that we specify the name of the class that we wanna make our object from. We then need to give it a name of some kind. So in my case, I'll just use uh, the name of the class but with a lowercase letter. Let's say this is equal to a new uh, instance of that class, so it's a new ball, and then we have the pair parentheses. So this, uh, the specification that I use right here, we're saying the name of the class, uh, we give the variable for it some kind of name, this is equal to a new, we have to use this new keyword to make sure that we are uh, set aside, setting aside some space on our computer to be able to create this object, and then we just again specify the name of the class with this pair of parentheses. So this little part right here, this is going to be what's known as the constructor method. So in much the same way as we've seen this pair of parentheses used to call a method, uh, when we do that for a uh, with the name of a class like this, this indicates that we're calling the constructor method specifically. Okay. And so we can kind of compare this against the uh, declaration and the initialization for a primitive data type. So maybe we have an integer. So we have int. We call it something like number. This is equal to a value like 10. So we can kind of contrast these two things. Again, we see this uh, pairing up right here. We have our uh, class type. So whatever the name of the class was, we want to specify that here. In the case of our primitive data types, we'll just specify the data type that we're using, say like int. We then have to give our variable name. So in this case, I have ball. In this case, I have number. And then when we say that this is equal to something, we were going to, uh, in the case of our primitive data type, we'll specify a value that is directly associated with the variable. And in the case of our, um, our object, we're using the new keyword and this call to the constructor method. So now that we've seen this little bit right here, I then want to go ahead and kind of uh, flush this out a little bit further. So the idea here, whenever we create a primitive data type, we are setting aside some memory for the variable that we're using. So we're going to give it the name and then we also have the value right here. So this tells us that if we were to look into the memory of our program, if we look at the location where this variable number is, we will see that the thing that it is storing is the exact value 10 that we put into it 
On the other hand, if we look at our objects, we do the same thing where we take a look where the variable itself is. We look at our variable ball. The thing that we're going to find here is not actually going to be the object that we created. Instead, what we're going to find here is going to be a memory address that points to or identifies another location in memory where the object is actually being stored. So this tells us that there's going to be this separate location somewhere else in memory. And right here is where we're going to find our actual ball object. And so then we have our little reference, so some kind of memory address that uh, effectively points to or points us in the direction of the ball object somewhere else in memory. Okay. Okay. Uh, the other thing to discuss a little bit is going to be what is actually contained inside of our class. So what is it that we need to put into our class so that we can go about creating these objects? So we'll take this ball example. So we've got our code right here. We'll end up creating our public class ball. Let me size this back down a little bit. Let's make it a little bit larger. Run there. And have our closing curly brace right here and then the stuff that's going to go inside of here so there's a couple of different things we're going to place in here the first thing that we'll have right here is going to be a bunch of data that we put into it and this data is going to be in the form of fields okay so these fields are effectively just a set of variables so one or more variables that we associate with the class. So then whenever we go about creating objects from this class, these variables, the data, will be unique for each one of those objects. Okay. So in the case of a ball, uh, typical things you might expect to see in this, uh, you might uh, include things like the size of the ball, maybe the color of the ball, uh, maybe the um, how bouncy the ball happens to be, if you need to evaluate that in some way. So you'd have some data like that inside of this. The next thing that we might see after that is then going to be the behaviors that we can associate with this class. And this will be in the form of methods. So you're a little bit familiar with methods already. It's basically just, um, just a piece of code that we can uh, call on later so we can execute something. In the case of a class, we're using this to describe certain behaviors that we might associate with it. So in the case of a ball, some typical behaviors might be things like being able to bounce the ball or throw the ball. Uh, those are pretty standard behaviors that you could see here. In addition to this, another kind of method, as I mentioned before, usually the very first method that you would specify right here at the very top is going to be the constructor. So within the methods, one of those is going to be the constructor that you use to actually create or make or construct an object of this class. Okay. Uh, one last thing to make a note of about this. Uh, there's also going to be a particular characteristic of classes that we want to try to adhere to. This is going to be what's known as encapsulation. So we have this idea known as encapsulation. I'll place that here. And the general idea with encapsulation, when we want to try to apply this to class uh, classes, uh, there are two types of encapsulation that we want to try to adhere to. The first is going to be what is known as data hiding. And essentially the way this works is whenever we create these fields of data, we want to make sure that uh, when we use the, uh, or when we create objects outside of this in other classes, that those other classes cannot directly access the data that we've placed into this class. And the reason for that is that we want to make sure that uh, the user can't just access this data just in any way that they please. 
We want to make sure that there are certain protocols or certain um, guidelines that they have to adhere to if they want to be able to access that uh, data. And the way that they go about accessing it is going to depend on the set of behaviors that you uh, place into the uh, code for your class. So usually this is going to be in the form of uh, some number of methods or behaviors for being able to go out and access the data so that they can actually uh, see it or look at it as well as some number of methods that are used to modify or manipulate the data in some way so a set of uh, feel or a set of methods to change the data okay uh, the second kind of encapsulation is going to be what is known as implementation hiding uh, essentially the way that this works is that Whenever you go about creating these methods, this set of behaviors for the class, uh, as far as the internal details of these methods go, usually you want to design them in such a way that the user doesn't really have to know exactly what's going on inside of these methods. The only thing that they're really concerned with is what it is that they need to put into the method and then what it is that they're expecting to get out of the method. How you go about you know, uh, tr uh, translating from one to the other or you transition from one to the other it doesn't really matter that much to them as long as it's doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, so those are the two types of encapsulation that we want to look at is data hiding and uh, implementation hiding. All right, uh, so this is going to uh, wrap up everything that I want to talk about on a sort of fundamental abstract level with classes for right now. Going into the next video, I want to elaborate a little bit more on some classes that you are likely already familiar with. Uh, going into a little bit more detail about the Java API and then for the rest of the videos after that we'll start getting into uh, actually implementing classes and going through some code 